Welcome everyone. I'm delighted that you could join us for today's MTI research webinar, Beyond Crypto, Blockchain for Urban Development, which explores the potential of decentralized systems like blockchain technology for financing and delivering urban infrastructure and services. My name is Dr. Karen Philbrick and I'm the Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University and your moderator for today. MTI leads three multi-university competitively selected consortia. The first, the Mineta Consortium for Transportation Mobility is funded by the US Department of Transportation through the University Transportation Centers Program. The second is the California State University Transportation Consortium funded through the California Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017. And finally, most recently, we were the proud recipients of a $4.7 million grant from the Federal Railroad Administration to develop the Climate Change and Extreme Training Events Center. MTI's mission is to improve the mobility for all by improving the safety, efficiency, accessibility, and convenience of our nation's transportation systems. Today's webinar focuses on using blockchain and distributed organizations to empower communities and urban infrastructure. As we all know too well, many cities face crumbling transportation infrastructure, housing shortages, and insufficient capacity to provide municipal services. This research explores the use of blockchain to create opportunities to empower individual citizens and communities to solve these pressing issues. Our speakers today include Dr. William Billy Riggs, a global expert and thought leader in the areas of automation and future transportation, clean technology and urban development and city planning. He is an MTI research associate and a professor and program director at the University of San Francisco School of Management. He has been featured in multiple global media outlets such as The Economist, Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post and The Atlantic. And in his spare time, he's authored two books, End of the Road, Reimagining the Street as the Heart of the City, and Disruptive Transport, Driverless Cars, Transport Innovation, and the Sustainable City of Tomorrow. Billy will be joined by Vipul Vyasi, a professor of management at the University of San Francisco. Vipul has also been a serial entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley for the past 20 years. To that end, he's the senior vice president of vertical strategy at Prashado, an AI platform that uses and transforms language into a growth lever for business. He's also the co-founder of the healthcare startup Symphony RM. Vipul is responsible for creating over $4 billion in trackable benefit for his clients over his career and is named on 10 US patents. Wow, I can't think of two better individuals to to lead us in today's discussion. Thank you for being with us today. I know that this is a new area for me and I'm looking forward to learning more. During the webinar, if you have any questions for our presenter, you can submit them through the chat or through the Q&A feature. We are recording this webinar and the link to view it will be available shortly on our website and our social media pages. Thank you so much for being here today, Billy. I'm gonna give you the floor. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Uh, and really happy to be here uh, yet again. Um, uh, Vipul uh, is a close friend of mine and colleague, and we had the opportunity to, to focus on this. And so, uh, Professor Vias, I'm going to let you take it away. And we really will we'll come back, Karen. We really want to kind of unpack this for practicing planners and engineers. Um, and so we will, we will hope that you will, you will challenge us if we dip into anything that is um, esoteric or, or perhaps uh, uh, doesn't make sense because we um, really kind of see some opportunity here for monitoring the future of transportation infrastructure in a different way um, at the neighborhood level as well as uh, beyond that. So um, maybe I'll, I'm going to let Vipul start us off and I'll bring us home. So thanks for the great introduction, Karen. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to interrupt you. And <laughs> to that end, it might be every few minutes, because like I said, this is very uh, new to me. So I'm excited. Take it away, Vipul. Sure. Um, thanks again for the introduction. And again, today, what we're really talking about is the application of blockchain and a concept we call autonomous community ecosystems. 
um, to better our municipalities. Um, and the application of this is pretty broad based from democratizing finance and how things are funded to actually the delivery of specific services like transport, housing, greening, and the like. So it's pretty broadly applicable. We'll probably look at a few specific use cases today to make it more tangible and concrete, um, but the applications are very broad in general. So with that, we can kind of jump into why bother? Why are we talking about this to begin with? If we go to the next slide, um, we can kind of think about the problem a bit together, which is essentially government has ceased in many people's eyes, not all, but in many people's eyes being as responsive and as functional as it could be. And so the sort of general summary of problems is that people don't perceive government works, or at least works for them. Uh, corollary to that is that it's unresponsive and that maybe it even appears to be incompetent at times. Um, those are sort of bold statements, but this is sort of the welling that you see in the polity, um, whether perception is reality or not, this is where people are. And it is a confluence of a lot of macroeconomic forces and social forces that all are converging at this time in society to kind of create some of these perceptions. And again, even worse, people may perceive government to be corrupt or captured by special interests, um, or more innocently that it's overly centralized and bureaucratic and that <laughs> as a function of that, it's become ossified and can't meet a lot of basic needs. And so with that backdrop of sort of an erosion of um, uh, confidence in uh, government, you kind of have what we would talk about in the next slide. Um, a sense that, um, if we advance it to the next slide, uh, yes, uh, the, the big statement here is simply that there's a perception that government is bureaucratic and is really oriented towards uh, perpetuating itself versus meeting the needs of the citizenry. And so again, um, when people interact day to day with government, this is potentially what they feel. It's not universal, obviously, it varies by locality. Um, but in many cases, especially as we've observed in the, on the West Coast and the West Coast cities, this is a perception that you have, and it bears out in political, politically unexpected outcomes, um, things like in San Francisco, recalls that really weren't imaginable, weren't imaginable in the recent past. And so there's a brewing sense of, the, you know, within the citizenry that something just isn't right in terms of government effectiveness. And then if we go to the next slide, the implications of all this are that people have a perception that government is uh, an extractive versus contributory force. So a perception that we kind of put together looking at um, different folks from a social media perspective was that there is a lot of belief that, or there's you know, some belief systems out there that government extracts wealth um, from the citizenry in terms of various taxes, um, and then there's a centralized budgeting, budgeting process that the average person really doesn't have access to, even though we have a representative system, they've elected many officials, but other people have more access to the actual powers of um, the levers of power and through that centralized budgeting process and the corresponding political apparatus that mostly special interests get to decide where different funding and monies flow. Um, and those could be to preferred contractors, uh, preferred nonprofits, uh, potentially, um, you know, uh, union special interests, if that's how uh, people perceive those, and then unresponsive functions, meaning parts of the city government that may not be um, as responsive or as functional as people would hope they be sort of dead end departments, if you will. And this may not be entirely true or not even entirely fair in terms of maybe this is a completely appropriate allocation of funds, but when it's coupled with a sense that things aren't working, this becomes an easy thing to start to blame. Um, and again, this is the way that we've operated uh, at a very high level for a very long time, because it's generally worked. You essentially have funding sources, you have a system that um, adjudicates how those monies need to be spent, and then allocates those monies uh, accordingly. Um, again, but it's a very centralized function. And so this is a hallmark because the centralization provided um, economies of scale when it came to actually executing this, this uh, type of allocation of, uh, of wealth. Um, if we go to the next slide, the implication of this is that you have an ongoing erosion of trust. People don't see things working. They assume something nefarious with the mechanism by which um, energy and wealth is allocated and the 
natural sort of tendency then is to blame some external force, meaning that apparatus I just described, and then the trust between the citizenry and the government that is an extension of that citizenry um, starts to break down. And that's the one important point to make there is the government's really just an extension of us. We kind of forget that sometimes. It's not, it's at least in our you know, democratic system, it's not some external force that's weighing upon us, but it's starting to feel like that to people that it's not something they can control. It's not something they can influence or have a voice in. And so they feel powerless and then victims of that system. And so this creates a, an environment of potential um, distrust or erosion of trust. If we go to the next slide. So what does this mean in terms of potential solutions? Um, you can look at alternative approaches to how uh, funding is possibly allocated. And this diagram that we're looking at right now is really a representation of what blockchain technical architecture looks like. And so we've gone from kind of everyday concepts to now deep diving into the arcane. But really the main point here is that any kind of blockchain type structure, and I'll step back and say the word blockchain is a little bit irrelevant for the moment. It's sort of the, the key point is any decentralized approach can be a potentially compelling approach, especially if that decentralized approach is secure, um, uh, accessible, distributable, distributed, immutable, and uh, trackable. And there's a variety of attributes here. I won't go through each one, but generally the idea is that I can have a system uh, which blockchain represents, and we'll get into the specifics of that in a few minutes, where I can have a pool of money that is for a specific purpose. Say it's for street cleaning, as an example. And I can have that pool of money and say that people who engage in street cleaning and can validate that they have done such engagement can get an allocation of those funds from that centralized pool of money. And essentially a blockchain is simply a tracking ledger. It's an accounting ledger but it's one that is not really run by any single person or central authority. It is not owned by anyone necessarily, though it could have um, particular entities or groups that have more influence than others, but in general, it is simply a database and specifically a type of database, a ledger that tracks uh, events. And in this case, the events could be, in the example I was giving, the act of street cleaning. And so say I have $10 million allocated in the street cleaning, cleaning budget, and I can say, here are the rules for street cleaning. You have to do X, Y, and Z. You have to um, sweep the street, you have to wa power wash it down, and then you have to um, send any a, a litter that's been picked up to a special um, uh, sanitation facility. And then as a fourth step, someone else has to come by and validate that you did that. Well, in that scenario, um, anyone uh, who meets certain criteria that the blockchain defines up front can participate. And this is the notion that's often bantered around called a smart contract. So if you can be uh, eligible for the system, you can essentially participate in this process. You can execute against these smart contracts that are made available uh, generally. And if you perform against the contract, which doesn't exist um, by a person sort of adjudicating it, but it's actually in code, it's actually in the form of a technology um, that's sort of predefined, like these are the steps, this is the mechanism of validation, and it executes on its own. So someone says, okay, I did the steps, another third party is assigned the act of going and validating that, that third party does so, and says, yes, this person uh, completed the steps as uh, defined by the blockchain parameters, then that event of street cleaning is recorded on the blockchain. And the specific terms of blockchain, we can get into why it's called that, but for simple purposes, it's simply a ledger again. That's recorded. It's publicly available. Anyone uh, as part of the network can look at it and validate and see that this has happened. And then the moment that event is completed, that person who did the street cleaning is now allocated some of the funds as described by the smart contract. You know, say it's a few hundred dollars um, and that's automatically allocated. And in this way, 
anyone can potentially participate, assuming they meet the criteria defined in the smart con contract parameters. And you have a distributed assignation or assignment of rights and settlement of payments. Um, and this is an important concept. So all of a sudden you've centralized uh, a lot of this activity. Um, if we go to the next slide, and, and Billy, feel free to jump in. It really, if you look at that uh, example I just gave, what that starts to do is give incredible visibility into how money is allocated, how it's spent, what actions are taking that deserve its allocation. Um, and it also lets a lot more people participate. If you look at the bullet points here, again, it reestablishes some trust with citizens. It really does that assignation of rights and transparency around the assignation of rights. And anyone can say, hey, look, I meet the criteria, uh, raise their hand and participate. It enables these sort of micro contracts and micro relationships I was describing. And more importantly, it creates the <laughs> fertile ground for um, enabling micro solutions. And it reduces the cost of overhead of administering a lot of the activity that you know, these types of micro contracts um, address. And it does this while providing a secure, sensitive, now fairly well-established architecture and mechanism to execute against this. So if we go to the next slide, um, really what we're doing is this concept of cryptocurrency and blockchain. And cryptocurrency is simply one application of blockchain, which is where um, effectively why it's called blockchain is that in each event, the uh, previous event's identity is coded so that one thing, one event links to the next event, links to the next event, and you create these blocks, these events that are, that are blocks that refer back to each other. And why is that important? Because then you create this string that you can't break. No one can come and try to corrupt it uh, and try to play with it, try to manipulate it, try to hack it. So it is open. Anyone can look at it, yet because of the way it's constructed with these Lego blocks effectively that tie to one another, and if you try to manipulate them, it sort of sends off a warning flag that it can be open and distributed, meaning different people can have copies of this ledger and feel secure and trusting and knowing that they can have that copy, yet the whole notion of immutable means you can't mess with it, to use a technical term, um, and that's what makes it um, confidence inspiring. So, yeah, and if you're uh, feeling like, you know, you're like, mind is blowing up right now, um, IRL, that means in real life. Um, right. We've all heard a lot about Bitcoin. It's so Kai Rizal says the economy is not the stock market, the stock market is not the economy many times. And I'll just say, um, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin is not blockchain and blockchain is not Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. And so what we're really talking about is really about process and process flow. And I think our, what I'm going to say, and I, I think um, what I want to go to um, this next slide, um, Maria, is this idea of um, this idea of proof of work and our pivot point really is like cities. And when, when I think about this and, and when I started talking with Dipple and many other folks about this early on, I thought about like, well, if blockchain is, is a blockchain, which forms the basis of, of much of this, this idea of cryptocurrency, blah, 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 these alternative currencies. Um, yeah, if that, if that is just simply a way of recording a sequence of events in a transparent and anonymous way, wow, that really translates itself well to many of our civic infrastructure and planning processes. And so when we think about that, what we want is this idea of, of proof of work. Like who is doing the work? Is it a city? Is it an individual? And is there an opportunity to leverage, and I think Vibble referenced this, to leverage the, the, the idea of, of ones and zeros, and that's what we're showing in this slide, but actual physical work is happening in everybody's neighborhood and, and seeing the value of that. So if we can just go to the next slide, our pivot point here is really like, how do we operationalize new forms of thinking about digital space and, and see that in real life? 
And that's really uh, what we try to do with this MPI project is really like, can we click create a general, generalized way of thinking about a flow and about a way of thinking about digitizing the physical things we do uh, in a way that is transparent, but it is also uh, more efficient than the way we currently do things. And when we think about the frustration that Vivil talked about with many of our cities around the globe about how, how hard it is to do something like plant a tree or uh, uh, go um, do a parklet in the, uh, in the parking space in front of your house, um, like that permitting process is somewhat broken. So what we're trying to say is figuring out a way of, can you create these transaction requests and referencing this graphic on the, on the right side of the screen, this idea of creating um, a digital infrastructure that creates a way of saying, citizens want this. Um, it can be created in a way that other people could perform the work. Said citizen who wants it necessarily doesn't necessarily do have to be the said citizen that implements the infrastructure. Um, and then the, there could be a record of having completed that. Um, and we'll, I'll come back to that. And then also this idea of uh, creating potential economic value. So we know from a body of research from MTI researchers, um, from researchers around the globe, that when, when we plant a tree, when we change the, the, the characteristics of a street, there is implicit value to our neighborhoods and how that street connects to property values, connects to many aspects of our community. And that, that value has meaning. And whether or not it's represented in, in actual housing values um, is TBD. I mean, I think there's some literature that suggests it does, but at the end of the day, um, it has other values. It has shade value. It has carbon sequestration value. There are many aspects that we think about that then necessarily may not be accounted for. And so there is a way of commoditizing these activities to happen in our community. So we go to the, the next slide. One of the things we're thinking about is this, um, this idea of urban greening and street greening and, and thinking of that as, as one of the, the most simple ways of doing this. So one of the things we've been able to do as a part of this um, project and this, um, it's a unique thing because we, we've leveraged some funding from the state of California and our cap and trade funding to experiment with the fact that can we incentivize um, urban street greening and blockchain use of urban street greening as a part of a bigger kind of ecosystem where citizens engage in uh, planting trees, for example, on the public right of way in their own community. So we go to the next slide. What does that really mean to in terms of of uh, kind of what we can potentially unlock. So um, what does that mean and in terms of the next slide? Um, it means that we can uh, potentially look at, at, at vacant lots. We can look at untapped community capacity. Uh, we can look at everything that makes um, our community resilient during disasters. Um, and, and there's a lot of literature that supports that, the idea that like our communities are more resilient when they have uh, citizens that are actually connected and know one another, neighbors that actually uh, know the names of the people that live next door, um, and also the potential for, for potential new funding sources. And that's a core of, of what Mineta Transportation Institute has been focused on is like, thinking about new ways of economically supporting infrastructure. So, you know, pivoting to this idea of like, well, if we were gonna look at this idea of like, well, what would planting a tree look like in a blockchain environment? And if we could show the next slide, well, I think what we'll see is like, that could be a very digital process. And so what we mapped out and also what we are potentially deploying, we'll have a couple slides that kind of illustrate this. We have a pilot project that we're trying to deploy this uh, in, 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 in East Oakland as a part of a, a transformative climate, climate communities grant. And so we're really leveraging some MCI funding to really try to see, can we actually pull this off? Can we do a distributed uh, finance approach to uh, something as simple as planting trees 
Um, so we, can we say like, I want a tree and you know, you, you show that application. I want a tree in my front yard. I'm going to click here on my phone and want it here. And then it becomes, you know, somebody comes and plants a tree there. And then maybe that person, um, we have a proof of work that goes to a ledger and that, that, that specific digital uh, piece of information on that distributed piece of information that is totally anonymous in terms of who completed the work but it's recorded, they've taken a picture of that tree they planted in my front yard. Um, what happens when that actually has a financial or social value to um, that individual as well as the broader community? And I think that's, that's what we're trying to tap into here. Um, I'm gonna show, if we go to the next slide, um, this is actually a terrible slide to show in a presentation like this. So we're gonna like spend like 30 seconds on this. But what we're trying to show here is that we have, there are unique nodes in a workflow. And if you go to the MTI report that is available in the link that you downloaded or the link you signed up with, we've kind of mapped some of the, the process flow in terms of what, how the engagement, um, in terms of what way we believe it would work, um, should look. And potentially, if you look at the big uh, dotted diagrams here, you see this kind of generalized process flow. Um, if you have a transaction request, this idea of a distributed request to an ecosystem, a network-based approach to completing work, and this idea that the network can actually complete that work um, in much the same way that Uber or Lyft completes, you know, taking on rideshare or travel, if you complete that work of actually building physical infrastructure, then that infrastructure can, can be represented by digital blocks added to a digital chain that represents economic value to community. It can either go to cities or it can go to individuals that have actually completed that work. And that's really in the simple things, if you saw this as a yellow block, yellow dotted block, a red dotted block, a purple dotted block, and a green dotted block, that's what we're trying to show here. Um, so, if we can go to the, the, the next uh, slide here. Uh, and you know, Billy, I'll add one thing on the previous yeah. slide. If you don't mind, if we just go back for one moment uh, to, to break the flow, sorry, speaking of flows, is one thing that's important, I think, to highlight is the notion that um, in the blockchain world, and especially sometimes what you hear about in the cryptocurrency world specifically, remember, cryptocurrency is simply a application of blockchain. Blockchain is the general technology cryptocurrency that people hear a lot about um, out in the world these days is simply one use of blockchain. And one mechanism in cryptocurrencies is concept of proof of work. When we talk about proof of work in the cryptocurrency world, it's really computers doing these, playing a lottery. They're essentially running a, a bunch of computations, which is why you know, they have lots of servers for crypto mining activities. Um, and they're essentially trying to use these computers to guess at a number, to play a lottery. And that is the idea of a proof of work. Um, and the reason they bother doing that is because what they're saying is that you have to prove that you are um, active and in, in actually doing something to participate. The cost of actually participating limits the amount of currency that can be created. It's a mechanism by which to throttle down the supply of cryptocurrency that can be quote unquote mined. So in the concept of proof of work, when it comes to these blockchains and whatnot, um, they are uh, really not terribly useful. And the real power here is we've taken that concept um, of proof of work and actually made it real work. It's real productive work that actually benefits someone versus computers trying to play a you know game of bingo. So with that, I'll I'll turn it back over to you, Billy. Uh, no, no, yeah, no worries. So Alvarino, if we could just go um, to the um, you know to the next slide. I mean, I think what we're ta really talking about is does this mean that we can fill potholes? Does this mean that we can create environments that actually are that do increase ozone canopy, things like that, and I believe that like a good one, I see a potential for urban transformation for uh, potential urban greening. Uh, China a couple of years ago did exactly what you see on this chart slide. They planted a, a um, so I'm in Belgium tonight. I don't know if folks know, I, it, it's, it's um, your, your midday, I'm late in the evening. And um, I, um, 
what we see, what we saw happen in China is they planted a, a forest through community-based measures about the size of the um, country of Belgium, which is uh, quite stunning. And they did so in a way where citizens invested in such a thing. They did it through actually paper-based script. And Vival and I were really inspired by that when we did this, uh, when we wrote this report. Um, but when we think about that, and if we go to the next slide, what we have, you know, we can do this, you know, we can do this through um, a paper-based process. But I think what we, if we look at this, and this is an illustration of what we've worked with our Oakland clients, and this is a part of the, um, there's a, a transfer, transformative climate communities problem. We've, we've tried to actually work with our Oakland team on actually deploying this, this thing that MTI really seed funded, this idea of, can we eliminate, if we're gonna do urban street tree greening, can we eliminate this paper process of going out and actually doing tree requests for, for street trees? Can we actually save cities money? And can we actually engage in uh, urban heat island mitigation and our urban beautification at the same time that we're actually on uh, doing carbon sequestration? And we can use a traditional paper-based product, um, but maybe there's a way of actually building uh, platforms that actually allow for permit activities to be logged, inspections to be logged, and, and the attributes of trees and the validation of plantings to be logged. So we did a, a preliminary GIS-based uh, platform of this, and now we're moving to, if we go to the next slide, uh, a true uh, mobile-based blockchain um, documentation of uh, a process flow where uh, uh, citizens can actually uh, log requests, it goes through a network, it goes um, the, uh, the activities that they engage in are tokenized and they are, they, they are logged to a blockchain and then they, they do have a value. Now, I think that right now, like that value right in, is vague. Like can citizens just go and commoditize a, a, a nugget of carbon? If that's, you know, that's very ephemeral, you know, like I plant a tree and like I get the value of the, the tree that I planted in terms of the, the amount of carbon I sequester, um, that, that marketplace doesn't exist. But uh, I think what, you know, question we ask as a part of this is that there is a, is a future where we believe that that, uh, that marketplace will exist, um, where there is a value to that creation. It's not just sequestration value, it's urban heat line effect, it's, um, it's property value, it's street beautification. Um, there, if we, if we look at like the value to the pedestrian and the walkable environment in terms of the, what we do is um, without question what we can do. And if we can go to the next slide, I think there's, a, there's an example of what I view as kind of the organic process that is this happened and if we go to the next slide we'll see that like what happened during COVID was that like we saw more complex things happening we saw like people getting rewarded for things like um and if we go to the next slide things like putting up a park lane in front of a business and if we were going to sustain this is there a way to to provide the revenue for example for the, the lost revenue for, for example, for this parking space that's in front of a business in San Francisco. And how do we actually sustain that revenue? Maybe it's through a community-based process of investing in what we wanna see on our public right of ways. Um, and that maybe the neighbors really would contribute to sitting uh, outside in a, in a hospitable environment. And, and maybe it's a much different environment. Maybe it's an environment with street trees here. And, and that's where I think when we think about like the applications, whether or not it's things like as simple as picking tables in a street, or if we go to the next slide, things like, you know, there's, there's dog poop on my front, you know, on my sidewalk, or the, 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 I walk by this really terrible graffiti every day. Can someone please come out and fix this? I'd be willing to pay 20 bucks to see this go away. And the 
hypothesis that Vipul and I have is that not only would people would people contribute financially and socially to see this and this go away in their neighborhoods or or, or, or improve, and I, I go away perhaps is a little more assertive than I think I, I I'm comfortable with, because um, I actually think it's pretty beautiful graffiti. Um, but if we go to the next slide, it's um, if I think we think about like opportunities we have many if we look at like what google has given us the gift that google maps has given us is the ability to identify vacant and underused land and when we think about land use planning um the applications for identifying and then using community base community capacity community capital to say what is the capacity of these type of spaces that that uh haunt our urban our, our kind of urban form, could these these streetscapes become something different, and could they could they become places for that support uh, homeless you know homeless uh, supportive services? So could they become places that actually support higher density housing or low density housing? And and so the applications are super far reaching. And I'll turn it back to you, Vipul, because I think when we think about this, we shouldn't think this is a something new i think you want to start off with like everything new is old everything under the sun has been done before i'm turning it back to you people to give us a big hurrah close yeah next slide and you're on mute that always catches me um with the tree planting example that you were giving, Billy, and you mentioned China, which I'm glad you're able to meet folks that are directly part of that in Belgium. Um, they did this by paper. They simply had uh, a very similar mechanism. They had a grant uh, of money that they gave uh, people notice that they could participate. There were rules of the road, and they simply had a small, uh, literally it was a small piece of paper, like a certificate that says, you have the right to participate, you can do this. Um, and uh, once they planted the tree and there's a mechanism by which they uh, took some burlap off the um, the bag that was used for the tree, there's a few things that to do to validate. And then another person came and verified that they had planted the tree correctly. They got a small amount of money. And so they literally unleashed an army of hundreds of thousands of people to plant trees. And as Billy said, by unlocking all that human capital potential built pent up desire to participate, they planted an area the size of Belgium, um, millions of trees uh, over a large swath of land very quickly. That happened within a decade. And they actually reduced sandstorms in Beijing and a lot of other benefits. And they actually, uh, this was done in a desert. So they actually pushed a desert back and this was near the Gobi. So they actually reclaimed quite a bit of desert land. Now, what does this slide that I'm showing right now have to do with anything? Well, a lot of these um, activities can be rewarded in the form of local script. California actually has a law that allows for local currency. And so this idea of what we've talked about, cryptocurrency and things of that nature, it's actually not terribly new. If anyone looks back at what currency looked like in the United States, it was usually issued by municipalities. It was issued by local and state chartered and nationally chartered ordered banks, not by the US government. Um, the common, the Federal Reserve note that we're used to is actually a relatively modern construct. But more importantly, all of these currencies, these little paper notes were uh, and are micro contracts. Um, there's a, it's a bearer asset where you're um, able to use this. It's essentially a debt instrument of whoever the issuing entity is in most cases. Um, and so if you think about it, if you pull back and say you can reward people for engaging in these social activities, these socially benefit, beneficial activities in the form of these local scripts that can then be traded locally, that can be consumed locally um, and use as tender. Uh, and in doing so, you keep a lot of the money that you have now plowed into the ecosystem local because now it circulates in an area where that money is accepted and you get a reinforcement of keeping that money supply um, in the area, helping the community versus leaking out and escaping you know, to far parts of the country or the world. Um, so this is a concept that was used to do exactly this 
in many places in the US, including parts of the Bay Area. This is an example from the city of Detroit um, from around the time of the Great Depression. And so this concept of scripts um, is very old uh, and very tried and true. And blockchain and the concept of cryptocurrency are just new manifestations of something that has been around and proven in years gone by. And you drop the mic. Yeah. Yes. So I think with that said, we you know, we'll turn it over to you. I mean, like everything, everything new is, you know, is old. Uh, everything in the sun has been, and we're, we're being ecclesiastical and turning it over to you, Karen. Well, I heard some things that I did understand, like in real life and mess with it, but that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for making it relatable with some of the examples and some of the images. Incredibly helpful. We do have a couple of questions from the audience, so please forgive me while I read these verbatim. The first is, oh, this is a good question. How are the overall goals of the community established and or coordinated? For example, you mentioned tree planting versus street sweeping versus graffiti removal and other such things. And the second part to that question is, what's the role of elected officials? I'll take that one first, Billy, if you don't mind, then I'll Perfect. let you answer. Um, I think you still have the allocation of funds that the blockchain can draw upon in the example I was giving before where it's $10 million for street clean. So someone has to make that allocation, <laughs> you know, and that could be uh, the government, um, you know, from a bureaucrat bureaucracy perspective where it's sort of um, statutory or mandated, or it can be elected officials, right? That mechanism is probably going to vary based on the nature of what's being funded in the locality. And so that doesn't change. Now, I would say that that mechanism of getting money injected into the block system from which you're going to make payments um, can happen from a government perspective, but it doesn't have to exclusively be that. Because the blockchain sits autonomously, that's one important thing, it is not necessarily tied to the government. It is simply a vehicle that the government may choose to participate in. It may even set it up for that matter um, and say, hey, we've established a blockchain for street sweeping. This is how it'll work here, the rules of the road. And they may even claim 51% consensus voting, which is a way to govern the rules. We don't have to go into the details there, but that does not necessarily preclude a third party to make a charitable donation into that uh, blockchain, that network, and and then actually promote uh, street cleaning activity. In fact, it lets them sort of contravene and inject themselves into a process that they feel may be underfunded. Um, and so, or they can say, we don't even want the government involved. And you could have a regional uh, neighborhood type of association that does this independently. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting th things that open up. And I don't know, Billy, if you want to add to that. Well, I think, I think, you know, Karen, what we've seen happen in throughout the country in the U.S. is like this disaggregation of um, uh, political ownership of space. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, particularly, and, and particularly when we have this thing in city planning called the, the plan unit development, which usually is not a part of city public works infrastructure projects. So most in the US, in California, across the, you know, it's really across the country, most PUDs are responsible for their own infrastructure. And that is the most convenient way to build a project. And so you are conceivably, if you're a neighborhood and you do a, a plan unit development, you do a subdivision, you may or may not be fall under your city's infrastructure. And so we're already seeing this idea of disaggregated infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So this, this trend has been, has been there for a while. And, and the great part is, is cities have been like, fantastic, take your infrastructure off of our books. Like, but the problem is, is cities haven't thought about like what happens when the infrastructure starts to fail in these new neighborhoods that, we, that aren't on our books. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're saying is like, there is a pathway to where citizens can own that infrastructure. And there is a, is a contributory pathway where even if that's not embedded in the local HOA, that, because um, it's not, 100% the roads are not currently embedded in the HOA. Like that just, there's no mechanism for that. Um, there, but what we're seeing is like, it, even in urban areas where physical infrastructure is a part 
of the public right away. There's not money to do. I want a parklet in front of my house. I want a, I, I don't want that parking space in my house. I actually want street trees and an urban garden in that parking space. There's a mechanism where I can actually physically make that happen. I can be the change in my own world. And so I think that's where, where what, what I would, you know, this question is fantastic. It, it is. really sets up a lot of, of where, where Vipla and I have really, you know, this may be three to five years beyond, but if I was a public policymaker, I would be really, if I, if I was an elected official, I'd be saying, Billy, let's have coffee. I want to talk about how I can figure out how to enable my citizens to finance a, a parklet in front of their house. That the empowerment that is, piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, you that, see that, Billy. That in, empowerment in the, in the, piece is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But Billy, I want you to look very closely at the HOA fees I pay because I'm, I'm yeah. wondering if they're sneaking something in there. They're so high. But time is getting limited. So let's go to our next yeah. question. Vipple, did you want to add something to what Billy just no. said? Oh, very quickly, the HOA is actually a classic example where you could actually set that up as a blockchain to have more of a sense of where does that money go and you can be able to actually inspect it versus having to go to the HOA meetings and probe, right, which is not fun or or, or the best use of your time. And I think the, the one point Billy made in terms of trapped, um, the trapped energy of engagement that people want to unleash is like exemplified by guerrilla gardening. People literally are throwing balls of seeds on curbs so that they grow wildflowers because they want to do something, but that is, it's actually illegal to do that. Yet, why not codify it and let people express themselves in a way that's managed and actually useful, um, which we don't, we, we've trapped this human talent, capacity, and energy, and, and unleashing it is something we just have not bothered to do. And the term is seed bomb. Seed bombing. Seed I'm bombing. Sorry, yes. See, I learned something new again today. So let's move on to the next question. Is the blockchain process generally one directional or does it allow for the flexibility of corrections and modifications at various points? It does. There's, there's basically a consensus mechanism that allows for corrections, but it can't be done unilaterally. So it does it in an orderly, but fairly prescriptive way to address mistakes effectively. And I think that that's, that's the most simple answer. And if folks have one clarification of the question, send us an email. I'm sorry, did you say if people send, have- Send us an, yeah, if these people have questions, that's a, there, there's a, it's a nuanced process and we can, we can, we can provide more detail via email. Does that mean we have your permission to drop your contact details into the chat? Always. All right, Alvarina, if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Let's go to Jesse Glazer's question. I see two potential benefits. One, a potentially better way to manage some public services and two, guaranteed transparency. But is blockchain the best way to achieve this or can more conventional and perhaps simpler technology be used to achieve the same results? That's a great question. I mean, yeah. you could do a lot of this with simply a relational database, right? Um, a typical, then that's okay, jargony, I'm sorry. A typical just database. Um, a GIS, that a is GIS open. system. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. We, we did this, we did it with this uh, ArcGIS in Oakland as our beta, beta project. And, and um, so the, oh, sorry, I was just saying one last thing, really. That was just like the real differentiator in the end of blockchain is um, just a database that no one owns because it lives by everyone's. Um, agreed upon rules. And once those rules are agreed upon, it is its own entity and no one can sort of seize control of it. That's one aspect that's interesting, but I don't think that's the main benefit. The main benefit is that you can incorporate the notion of these micro contracts, which a database doesn't have that feature where you can say these to write to my database to actually put an entry in, you have to satisfy these preconditions and the technology is just set up inherently to do that better than traditional technologies that are out there. Well, and I think, I mean, I would actually, from an academic standpoint, um, so there's intrinsically another benefit. This is, it's, a, it's actually one of scale, economies of scale. What you're harnessing in terms of blockchain is, is something bigger than a referential database. And, you know, I, I hope Hillary Nixon, one of our other colleagues can, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to her a lot about this, this paper, but like what we're doing is if you can create a bigger economy, conceivably, you can do bigger projects at a micro level 
by people thinking about like, I want to see this type of infrastructure, not only in my neighborhood, but other places. And so if you're willing to actually think of your economy as bigger than your block, I think that what you, what you end up is, is, is a, an ecosystem and a potential financial ecosystem that has the, the opportunity for impact beyond, um, beyond this, this, uh, the people that you know in your own social world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and I, I think, oh, yeah, sorry, I was at one. Go ahead. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, let's let's go ahead, it's Karen. So I just, this is a bit sophomoric, so forgive me in advance, but are there any cybersecurity risks or issues to be concerned with? Go for it. Yeah, there, I mean, there always are theoretical ones, but the, the blockchain has proven itself to be fairly secure. That's why you have so many of these cryptocurrencies. Now, they can exchanges can be hacked. That is something that's happened, and so you don't want to underestimate that. But the security, the secure nature of blockchain has been pretty well established. Yeah. So I mean, there, there are concerns, is, but there's proof that those concerns are probably no more um, associated with blockchain than other technologies that are out there. And if we're going to be specific, the biggest risk is actually people spoofing who they are like mm -hmm. i am i am not billy riggs i am i am the robot billy riggs so that mm -hmm. is like the um the biggest risk is people like faking that they are who they are understood thank you and we had some questions from participants submitted in advance so let me turn to those now what are some of your favorite examples of successful blockchain use for empowering communities or streamlining urban infrastructure improvement. Now, I know you touched on this with the tree planting and the seed bombing, but would you like to further expand on that answer? They're not very common to begin with. So the okay. applications Fair that enough. we described are ones. I mean, this is very, this is cutting edge novel um, technology. It's been used in the private sector, especially in real estate, um, in the in sort of the private world. And so, bringing this in the public sector is is novel. Um, I mean, one very big conceptual thing, this is not blockchain necessarily, but it ties to what we've been talking about. Like if you look at what Uber did to taxis, right? You basically took untrapped capacity in terms of people, cars that weren't being used. And now in a distributed way, because you had general rules of the road, no pun intended, defined, lots of different people could to participate in this thing as micro, through a micro contract as small entrepreneurs. Right. And this is the same idea, even though they didn't use blockchain, it's really the same idea of getting citizens because you give them the rules of the road, you told them how to do and participate in very clear ways. A lot of people can now get involved where before they just they, they were powerless or they felt powerless. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an example of kind of a real world thing that we can all feel that before when taxi medallions were doled out centrally versus, you know, by the government versus the government saying, all right, here's the rules of the road or an entity like Uber doing so. And then all of a sudden he had all this unleashed human capital and potential. Absolutely. And, and I, Karen, the biggest, sorry, I, I, the biggest kind of physical example um, is probably in Reno uh, in the West Coast is um, Mayor Reno was really interested in trying to preserve a piece of art in downtown Reno. I think it's, is it the cosmic whale or something? So um, he basically put this piece of physical art onto blockchain and sold off portions of it to potential philanthropic investors. That is a, the best physical example probably we have right now of like translating digital assets to a physical, like digital or like I say, physical digital investors in a piece of infrastructure. But this is actually, you know, as silly as it sounds, investing in a really beautiful sculpture in an urban center. Um, this is actually a really provocative way of, of paying for public infrastructure. And placemaking. Um, in placemaking, exactly. And so if I want a bench in front of my house, can I buy a part of that bench? Can I, when we have this fractional ownership, um, complete street? And, and so this is where I do think if we if we peel the layers and the onions, you know, as Vipul said, there there are, there are very few examples, and yet there are a couple examples, particularly in terms of urban art, where we're starting to see experimentation. And what we hope, and and as part of this part, what we hope is that there's 
experimentation, actual multimodal infrastructure on our streets uh, our, around the globe. You know, that was so helpful for me personally, and I hope it was for our participants as well, to really drive home that example with the art and with Reno. And it made me think of something I read in the news today about the riders in LA and seeking shade, for example, that the bus stops need to provide more coverage from the elements. Would that be something that would be amenable to this blockchain technology? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. one of the questions in the Q&A is, you know, would speed limits be pertinent? No, that's so. It's really not about criminal enforcement. This is about you know micro uh, assignation of rights and contracts. So, if you want to assign someone the the right to build that shelter and it has to conform to some specs, this is something you could you could do that with. Sorry, Billy, you were going to say. No, I, I would agree. I mean, like I think that the tree piece is um, is right in the line. It's um, but also like even like when we think about like the idea of shelter and I I. I, 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 I just can't get over the housing, you know, the housing crisis we have in, in many of our cities in the U.S. And the fact that, like, I can't use, like, a piece of my, if I have a single family home, I can't use a piece of my front yard to provide a shelter for someone that needs housing. And that process has to be so cumbersome. And <laughs> is there a way for me to use that? Street scrape, streetscape infrastructure to facilitate some type of of available need for that individual. Mm -hmm. We have time for one last question, so I'm going to pick this one. What tech would an individual need access to if a community decided to implement blockchain systems? Would this create any issues with accessibility or equity? I think this is such an important question, and I'd love to hear a round robin response. Meaning we have two minutes left, guys. What do you have to say? Well, so, um, go ahead. Go ahead, Bibble. I mean, like, no. Yeah, go ahead, Billy. I mean, I think what we're what we're hoping to do is, and we're open sourcing everything that we're doing. You know, what we're hoping to do is really kind of develop a platform that would allow for if cities wanted to plug and play something that would allow them to kind of build a basic blockchain that allowed them to deploy something you know rapid that would could be citizen enabled but there could be a playground that would allow them to do that and that is mm -hmm. that is my vision for this is that like we could create something that is community centric neighborhood centric and to be honest if you're a city planner in my mind it's it's a mount you might actually have to let go a little bit i mean i've seen so many planners that want to be prescriptive about like land uses and and like the way um and aesthetic looks and um you know more and more i see that um i'm okay if um if my if my my street looks a little more like chandichuk in in india uh mm -hmm. as opposed to uh as opposed to like downtown palo alto mm -hmm. um so i i think i i think to a certain degree it's um um the technology is out there it's not expensive I, th I think this is a, there's a can-do approach, um, and there's some there's ways to accomplish this that, that are plug and play. You know, Vipul, I don't know if you have any any additional thoughts on that. that no, I have think... to jump in here, Vipul, because it is one yeah, o'clock. Sure. So please, okay. very quickly. Yeah, very briefly. Like uh, today, your bank, your, your healthcare clinic, everything's right here, right? And if you have this, Fair this enough. is really all you need. I know some people don't have this. I do get that, but this is really all you need. This represents your gateway to so much access to so many things in society, as long as as well as this, to be honest. It's so true. And with that, our time has come to an end. I can't thank you enough for joining us to help break this down into layman's terms so we can understand how it can be applied. Again, thank you to Billy Riggs from joining us for Europe. I hope you can go out and enjoy the evening. It's getting late there, Billy. And thank you, Vipple. The final report to our guest is available on the MTI website and a link to that has been dropped into the chat. One last note before we go, please join us on October 13th at 5 p.m. to learn more about our Masters of Science in Transportation Management program that's sponsored by the Mineta Transportation Institute. This program is designed for working professionals. It offers a master's degree as well as specialized certificates in high-speed and inner-city passenger rail and transportation safety, security, and emergency management. 
Best of all, it's $12,750 fully accredited and can be completed in two years. So please join us to learn more. And with that, our webinar comes to an end. Thank you to our experts. You guys are awesome. This was wonderful. Take care, everybody. Bye.